Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us, especially on this rainy and windy evening. You guys are troopers. Um, we hope that the fragrance and warmth of Yuja black tea provided some comfort to you, and you'll hear about this tea and many others tonight. Tare, which means etiquette for tea or tea rite, has been an integral part of Korean history and culture for over a thousand years. I'm pleased to introduce Dong Hyun Kim, a Korean heritage curator, who will discuss tonight the history of tea practices and aesthetics in Korea and the landscape of contemporary um, Korean tea culture. You'll have a chance to ask your questions after, this present, after his presentation. If you're joining us via live webcast, and I know there are many of you, please send your questions via email, artsandculture at koreasociety.org. And now, please joining me in welcoming Dong Hyung Kim. Oh, thank you, Jay. Hi everyone, um, I'm Dong Hyun. I am very honored to be here today with you to discuss the philosophy of Korean tea. Uh, without further ado, I would like to thank all of you for coming out to today's talk uh, on this rainy, stormy day. Um, thank you to those who are watching on YouTube as well. Oh, also actually English is not my first language, but it's my fourth language. So even when you don't understand what I'm saying, maybe just generously nod yeah, for me. That'd be greatly appreciated. OK, so as you guys know, I'm a Korean heritage curator and tea master and the 18th generation descendant of Shisip Kim. Shisip is known to have written the first Korean classical novel in the 15th century Joseon, which is Kumo Shinhwa. Interestingly, he also composed 73 poems on tea that describe how to grow tea plants, how to process tea leaves, how to drink, and what to feel by drinking tea. He's considered a tea master by many scholars. Since I was a little kid growing up, I have always had tea around me at home. Also, I always wanted to gather any tea-related information that has been available to me and arrange them in an organized manner and share it with people since I have some academic background in art history. What I'm going to talk about today is a very heavily debated topic, I would say, in terms of not a lot of people have explored and narrowed it down to one certain thing academically. But I would like to talk about my personal experience of tea and what I have learned through my tea journey, which is still ongoing. It will be my personal view and also open-ended. I'm going to touch on the history of Korean tea first and then discuss the philosophy behind Korean tea practices and aesthetics. So, the history of Korean tea is over a thousand year long, but long story short, the first written record of Korean tea is actually in so-called Nihon Shoki, also known as the Chronicles of Japan, the second oldest classical Japanese history book. It says, in the 6th century, the king of Baekje bestowed Buddhist ritual items, incense, as well as tea to the royal court of Japan. According to the Korean history book, Samguk Sagi, also known as the history of the three kingdoms, the royal court of the Shilla dynasty and the Hwarangs, an elite group of young warriors enjoyed tea culture as early as the seventh century. And tea plants were introduced to the Korean peninsula from the Tang dynasty China in the ninth century. It was the Shilla dynasty when Kim Daeryeom, an envoy to China brought in and planted tea trees near Sangye, Buddhist temple in present-day Hadong County. Hadong is located in the deep south of the Korean peninsula, and it has rocky mountains named Jirisan. With its relatively milder climate throughout the year, and foggy and misty weather all year round, it's a perfect place for tea plants to grow. Tea was a rare good, so mostly it was consumed in the royal court. Chilla people would mix and boil tea leaves and various spices together 
and used as herbal remedies. In the following Goryeo dynasty, whose state religion was Buddhism, tea culture rose to the surface as it was mainly used in Zen Buddhist practices. It was Korean tea's golden age. There are tons of excavated utensils that we believe to be used for tea ceremonies, and enough texts, poems, and books from which we could explore Goryeo's tea culture. A very interesting fact we know is that the type of tea enjoyed by Goryeo people was unlike modern day Korean tea that we will touch upon later. As Goryeo shared a lot with the Song China in many different cultural sectors, tea was also influenced by Song Diancha, which is coin shaped then powdered tea. It's also the origin of Japanese matcha. But the color of the tea they pursued was white, like you see in the picture. And like matcha, they would whisk the tea to make foam. So in the making, there's a particular extraction process to partially remove chlorophyll. Korea people also prized white colored powdered tea. It is metaphorically described as white cloud, snow milk, milky flower, by nobles such as Yi Yubo and Yi Inno in their texts. Korea's indigenous tea, Daewon Cha, emerged in the 10th century and was exported to its neighbor states as royal gifts. According to many sources such as Goryeo Sa, which is um, also known as the history of Goryeo, one can assume that Daewon Cha was shaped into discs and ground right before tea ceremonies, just like Song Dian Cha. In the year 982, a government officer, Che Seung Lo, wrote a letter, Shimu 28 articles, to the emperor of Goryeo, saying that, quote, Your Majesty, I have heard recently that Your Majesty himself grinds and polishes his own tea for meritorious deeds for his subjects. It is highly concerning that such old traditions from the Emperor Guangzhong might cause tremendous fatigue to Your Majesty's body. This, this explains that it required a lot of physical labor to grind tea discs, and it also shows tea was practiced even by the Goryeo emperors. Tea culture flourished in Goryeo people's daily lives. Also, Goryeo salad and ware got its international fame in the Sinosphere for its prominent grayish green color that helps emphasize the color of the white tea. Furthermore, in modern day Korea, Goryeo's cultural legacy related to its tea culture continues. We, will, we still use the terms that Goryeo people once used, such as tabang or dashil, which means tea room, tajom for tea stand, and chare for ancestral rites. In the following Joseon dynasty, whose theoretical foundation was Confucianism, societal frugality and humility were highly valued by its scholars and the royal court, abandoning the Buddhist values and beliefs from the previous dynasty. A lot of Buddhist temples where tea was produced and practiced were shut down and torn down. Also, China's Ming Dynasty appeared in 1368, and the first emperor, Hong Wu, banned the production of powdered tea by imperial order due to its labor-intensive process. Korean tea culture was greatly influenced by it, and it faced its drastic change as well. Loose leaf tea replaced powdered tea, and it became more mainstream in both countries. In the early Joseon period, it is believed that tea is, was enjoyed by a few scholars, including my ancestor Kim Shisip, as well as Shin Sukju, and so on. Shisip handmade his own jaksol tea, which is loose leaf tea. King Sejong also gifted jaksol tea to the Japanese royal court. However, going through the Japanese invasion in 1592 and Qing invasion in 1636, Joseon experienced unprecedented poverty and adversity. And of course, tea was something considered uh, extravagant, so it became almost like a taboo. But it was never forgotten by the people. 
One thing we need to carefully look at is Kare Jip Lam, compiled by Kim Jang Seng in 1599. Um, this is actually a recent finding. A few decades, a few decades later, after the uh, Japanese invasion, in its image descriptions of ancestral rite tools, we can find tea utensils for powder tea making. I find it very interesting in that tea culture, including powder tea and loose leaf tea, never disappeared, but it continued in Korean people's life. In the later Joseon period, monk Cho Ui, who is considered the father of Korean tea, was born, and he emancipated the suppressed tea culture of Joseon. He practiced tea vigorously and left an important tea book titled Dong Da Song, also known as the Ode, Ode to Korean Tea, which gives every detail of Korean tea making, storing, aging, and brewing methods of his time. Of course, this tea and loose leaf tea together. He shared his knowledge with his contemporaries, such as well-known scholar Jung Ya Gyung, writer named Da San, and calligrapher Kim Jong Hee. On the other side, though, in 1819, Jung Ya Gyung mentioned in his book Aon Gakpi, quote, "These days, people infuse tangerine skin, ginger, quince, and they call it tea." But I would like to point it out that the use of this term is wrong. Lu Yu, who is considered the Chinese tea saint, said tea is only produced from tea plants. According to that, we also know different teas and and herbal teas were consumed and perceived as tea by Joseon people. That is why Korea still has a broader spectrum when it comes to tea. Afterwards, once again, it declined as Korea went through hardships, Japanese annexation for 35 years, and the Korean War. However, since the 1960s, Korea has been able to achieve a rapid growth in economy, but still most of Korean uh, traditional culture, including tea, was overlooked for it was considered something outdated from the past. Due to its up and downs, a, a lot has been forgotten. But luckily, nowadays, Korean people started look looking into their own national and cultural identity that is different from anywhere else. So Korean tea is also becoming very popular. There are tons of tea programs and gatherings one could attend. Um, it's on an upward trajectory. So now, we briefly cover the history part. So move on to the next. What's the reason for drinking tea? And what are the accumulated thoughts behind this historical practice that has been passed down from generation to generation over a thousand years? That's when the philosoph philosophy comes in. Broadly speaking, tea has been used as a means of spiritual self-discipline, which differentiates it from other drinks such as coffee and wine. Every moment is integral, and every object we use in a tea ceremony has a meaning. Now we understand tea is not just a type of caffeinated drink, but it, there is a profound meaning behind it. After doing quite some research myself, I was able to identify an encompassing concept that has been quoted repeatedly by Korean tea masters and connoisseurs from Korea to modern day Korea. It is Manghyeong. The literal meaning of Manghyeong is forgetting the shape. So what does that mean? The metaphorical meaning of Manghyeong is roughly translated as formless, borderless, unbounded, and a free state of one's mind. In Korean, the closest word would be 심적 여유. In other simple words, it gives you a stress-free break from ever-changing and fast-paced time and space. Let's see some text examples. In Igubo's poem, Staying in a Riverside Village, he says, I become Manghyeong in this Riverside Village having cha-jing 
also known as the classic of tea written by Tang Dynasty Lu Yu in my hand. In Soha Sonseng Jip from 1222, Im Chun's poem Taking a Nap at Tea House, it says, I become Mang Hyung after drinking tea and lying down, taking a break from restless life. Yi Sung In, who lived in later Goryeo and early Joseon period, left a book called Do Eun Jip, published in 1406. In one of his poems, In Monk's Tam's Room, he says, listening to boiling tea, I always I already become Mang Hyung in my white robe. Enlightened by tea, I no longer need Buddhist scriptures. Later in Joseon, it is said that Kim Shi Sub always had the following statement, Pung Myung statement to the north, written on the wall of the north side of his room. It says, Dong Jung Omuk Mang Hyung He. When you move or stop, when you speak or be silent, always stay mangyong, a free state of mind. Also in one of his 73 tea poems, Kim shi said, My mind is clear as water, unobstructed as it is shapeless and formless. This is the state of mind where I become mangyong. I sip on my own tea. Now for a visual reference, let's look at this painting by Yi Han Chol, who was a court portrait painter from the 19th century. The title of this painting is Mehwa So Okto, in English, Plum Blossom Studio. This painting is housed in the National Museum of Korea, and it consists of six panels, but we will look at this one closed cropped image. Beautifully painted mountains and surroundings covered in snow, and there's a gentleman sitting inside a hut. I can see he's a sambi, a scholar from Joseon, judging by his horsehair woven hat and clothing. Sambi is usually from an upper social class, so they would live in a house complex um, with its roof covered with kiwa, terracotta tiles. But seemingly bizarre, this building structure looks more like a thatched hut. Also, I noticed there is a huge round-shaped open window. Korea gets really cold during the winter and springtime. Given that plum blossoms bloom in early spring, this looks also strange to me. Right next to the hut, I see a young boy preparing tea for his master, waving a fan. When I saw this painting for the first time, I instantly noticed that this one painting well portrays the concept of Mang Hyung. I came back home and improvised a poem inspired by this painting, which is like this. As plum blossom unfold spring unhurriedly, I then become Mang Hyung, free state of mind at a mouthful of tea. So let me tell you about my interpretation of this painting. First of all, the six panels are quite big. Yet Yi Han Chol painted his human subjects in one panel, so small that it does not hinder you from watching the scenery of plum blossom blooming. Yi Han Chol also gently suggests that he consciously demolishes the border between the sambi and the surroundings by placing an open window. Also, circle-shaped windows don't really exist in Hanok structures. A circle in Asian culture means a perfectly free state of mind. The concept is called Chonwon Jibang. The sky, which is a paradise where everything's unobstructed, shaped as a circle, and the earth a square. Oftentimes, the concept is usually incorporated and expressed in Korean traditional garden ponds, as you can see in this image of Buyongjong in Changdeok Palace. So the little island in the middle of the pond means the sky, and then the pond itself means the earth. 
Plus, the zombie is immersed in a tea moment in which he is deliberately letting go of the things that are considered conventional to Joseon's upper class. But if you understand Mangyong, everything here could be comprehensible now. He's unbounded from the external world, being in this very moment. The zombie is at a free state of mind, becoming a part of nature as an entity that goes beyond its existence in time and space. Similar, similarly, Mang Hyung is well reflected in Korean tea wear and tea ceremony. Traditional Korean tea bowls and vessels are in such humble and rough surfaces, wobbly shapes, even if they could have made it better and perfectly circle. If you see the inside, however, it's usually perfectly shaped for practical use. In fact, Korean ceramists for sure perfected their skills, but they intentionally incorporated the Bangyang aesthetics to make us focus not just on the external beauty of its natural quality and character, but also on its novel philosophy behind tea. Also, even for the Korean daily tea ceremony, the Mangyang philosophy generally removes the border between the host and the guest as they sit closely and equally together, which is very distinctive from neighbor states' tea ceremonies. Unlike the Chinese and Japanese tea ceremonies, which highly emphasize artistic performance techniques and disciplines respectively, the Korean tea ceremony, tare, tea rite, involves a high level of mutual communication. Guests are freely and casually participate in conversations, making it more fluid and interactive rather than solely following ceremonial absolutes. So, Mang Hyung, that's it. Um, even when we don't try to find it so hard, it speaks for itself. The Mangyang philosophy and aesthetics are in our DNA as Koreans. And will it continue? Yes, I believe so. Some might say, I find it different. For example, Taseon Ilmi or Taseon Ilyo, meaning tea and Zen practice are the same, quoted by the tea saint Cho Ui, could be an example. And others might say, I don't agree with you. And that's okay. Korean tea does not force you to follow certain established uh, rules. As I mentioned before, it is a borderless and open-ended discussion. I feel that we're in such a fast-paced world that gives us a lot of mental stress. Tea time is something precious that sets us free and slow us down and make us really contemplate and be in the moment. I hope you guys enjoyed my talk and somehow it helps you understand what Koreans have pursued by practicing tea and why it is much needed even now. I hope everybody here today finds their own mangyong every day through their tea. Thank you so much again for joining us tonight. Thank you. If you have questions for Tongyeon, you can raise your hand and we'll bring the mic to you. Um, I'm going to start with a question from one of the online viewers. Um, this is from Scott. How much do we know about the practice of tea? Um, people, poets, scholars like Igibo, um, Sogojong, Imok, and Tasan, and others who wrote about tea, but may not have necessarily always touched on how they produced and prepared tea. So how do, how do we know about that, the practice of tea? So basically, I get my uh, research done usually reading uh, poems and um, some records from other countries as well, from China. But I have touched on some scholars, including uh, Igibo and Tasan. Uh, but for tea uh, practice and how they um, produce their tea and stuff, that's that's the question, right? That, that was also in the question. Um, my ancestors, she actually described um, how um, he grew his own tea plants. 
um, he said he cheated his own tea tree. I don't know why, but we could guess that um, cheating tea trees can produce more amino acid in tea leaves, which yields a lot of k a m c h i r m a d A lot of people know um, the k a m c h i r m a d as umami, um, which until recently many thought it was Japanese original way of uh, producing matcha and gyokuro, but it actually existed in Um, Joseon Dynasty as well. Yeah, hope this helps. Yes. 안녕하세요. 안녕하세요. Uh, do you consider the following teas um, Hongsam, Uwang, or Yeonggun? Mm-hmm. And, and, and the reason I say that is I feel like I've experienced manyang um, from those, mm-hmm. whether it's the smell, the color, um, the taste. They're, they're very subtle and different, but mm-hmm. they're not from tea plants. Right. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, I think it's more like a something that um, in. Um, I would say, like Korean people drink a lot of barley tea, and they store it like all the time in their fridges. And sometimes they would, you know, brew different um, tea zens and like herbal, uh, you know, medicines together with tea leaves as well. And the tea I actually served today is also uh, mixed up with some like herbal, you know, um, plants and tea leaves as well. So I do consider. Uh, tea zens and different, you know, herbal remedies as tea, but it is still debatable. Yeah, a, a lot of people don't really agree that it is um, that we should call it tea. Yeah, but it's um, more of uh, common use for now, I think. Yeah, and you could find a lot of uh, not a lot, but a few places in New York City where they serve Korean tea. It it includes uh, tea zens, yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, that was a great presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I was wondering if you have, through your studies and ex- exploration, a perspective on gender and mm-hmm. Korean tea and how that applies to just an understanding of tea culture in general. Uh, you mean the. Uh Have I ever explored tea in the perspective of different genders? Or yeah, I think because yeah. most of the historical books right. are all written by men or people who mm-hmm. identify as men, and I think especially with Confucianism, Neo Confucianism, there mm-hmm. was certainly a division of genders, right. whether of where the tea was consumed or yeah. how it was consumed. Mm-hmm. So I'm just wondering if you. Through your studies, have you know any perspective on that piece, or it's a question that I've asked myself too mm-hmm. in general, and I, I'm curious if there's a perspective on that about tea specifically and and tare. Yeah, I just said um, it's really difficult to find any records or um, books or like poems, anything that's available now from women, to be honest. Um, but from the 70s and 80s, um, there were, I think, women were more uh, engaged in the tea scenes in Korea. So I, actually, my family, my father does tea as well, but my mom was the one who would brought me, bring me to tea ceremonies and teach me how to do tea. Um, so, um, yeah, not historically, but... Now I think it, we're getting more, you know, different genders participated in this practice. Um, it's a direction that we're going, uh, leaning towards. So um, yeah, maybe in like a hundred years we'll see a lot more from, you know, different genders. Yeah. Hello. Um, so from my understanding, tea um, t- for in order for tea to be 
fully appreciate it. It needs time to reflect, uh, to contemplate, and not just drink the tea. Um, Korea is a modern society right now, and modern means long work hours. So how does that time to reflect and drink tea and appreciate tea work with a modern society work culture that is long hours? Right. <laughs> Uh, that's actually my question too. It's a really good question. Um, it's really hard to, you know, incorporate this difficult and long uh, practice into daily lives, honestly. But uh, for tea, I think you need to make that time for, um, you know, for yourself. Um, it's not that you can just uh, drink it as if it's like water or, um, you know, like I said, coffee. Um, other drinks are for uh, quick use, yeah, mostly. But for tea, I think you have to make time to really, you know, make a use of it. Yeah, um, maybe find some time on the weekends or, <laughs> yeah. And it takes time to, you know, just to have a cup of tea, yeah. I wouldn't recommend tea bags and you know other easy stuff though. Yeah. <laughs> to get the Mangyan philosophy, yeah, you will need to sit down and have some moment. Yeah. Hi, we have a question here. Yes. Uh, we're just curious what your top three Korean teas are. Uh, could you speak? Top a three, bit? your favorite teas. Oh, three, favorite could teas. You name yeah. Them and why? Yeah. You like okay. them? Favorite three teas, that's difficult. I have so many different teas that I like. Um, but uh, the tea, white tea, powdered tea that I showed uh, before, um, and actually I made my own tea in April usually. Right after this trip, I'm going back to uh, Hadong County to make my own you know, tea. And that's, that is so far my uh, favorite. Not because... Um, that I made it, but it's it has a lot of historical meaning, and it was almost forgotten by a lot of people. It wasn't practiced for maybe I would say like four or five hundred years, but then uh, thankfully now we're able to find more resources online, and we can access to a lot of different different books in different countries. So I was and many of my Many of my uh, friends and you know peer scholars uh, were able to find some more related um, tea books um, through which we were able to reinvent Korea style tea. Yeah, so so far that's my favorite. And then the second one is the one I just served today, Yuja Byeongja. It has very citrusy and earthy flavor to it and then easy to drink. It does not have a lot of caffeine. Yeah, and then the third tea would be, I would say, Chuklocha. Chuklocha is very um, um, native to Harun County. Uh, Chuk means bamboo, and Lo is actually metaphorically means tea. So bamboo tea, what does that mean? Um, so tea trees are naturally uh, they're growing under the shades of bamboo trees, so it gets the um, uh, effect of amino acid producing, you know, um, values. So it gets more kamchilmat, and it's not like regular sejak or chaksal green tea that we can find at market, but it has, you know, more flavors and rich kamchilmat, yeah. So I drink it almost every day. Those are the three. Um, I have another question from the viewer. Um, Tina asks, during the Joseon period, do you think children ever participated in the tea ceremonies or picking tea leaves in the fields? Yeah, I'm not sure, to be honest. Um, but even in the picture that I showed right here, um, you see a little kid you know, waving a fan, boiling water. Um, but in official records, I don't see any children or like kids involved in the formal tea ceremonies. But I can assume 
uh, based on not just this painting, but a lot of in a lot of different paintings, I uh, I see little kids boiling water. So maybe they were uh, involved in the preparation process. I would say, yes. Hi, thank you for a great presentation. Oh, thank you. Um, I have actually some practical question. Mm -hmm. So I've tried, I've been to some tare mm -hmm. tea ceremonies, and I myself, uh, I don't have a developed palate, but I was able to tell the difference between ujeon mm -hmm. and sejak. The quality was just so distinguishably different. Oh. So... Now, my question to you is, we're in New York, very busy city. If we want to learn um, about tea, what's the sort of practical way to learn? Um, maybe you can give us some um, YouTube channels or recommend <laughs> some books that we can learn. Uh, that's number one. Number two, uh, while staying in New York City, have you found anyone who are knowledgeable enough to give the tea ceremony and mm. about tea history? Yeah, um, so there are a few uh, tea dealers and tea uh, shops in the city where you can find Chinese and Japanese tea, but not a lot of Korean tea. Um, but to learn Korean tea, I think it's just like wine. You need to try different things and you need to sit down and, you know, have uh, maybe like little tasting cups and, you know, try all of them at once. You learn how to, you know, um, feel the differences. And then, then you can kind of like pick up how to, you know, taste and then how to... Um, catch the differences in teas um yeah so you you need time and then you need to get used to it and um in the in new york city i'm not sure so far but there must be some you know um shops stores that carry korean teas and if you need some information just send me a dm i'll give you some information yeah because i was able to find it on this trip yeah but not a lot so hopefully we get more you know korean tea dealers in new york city in near future the near future yep so there's a lot of questions coming in yeah. <laughs> from online viewers um a lot of people are very interested in the idea of who got to drink tea during the joseon um period if it was really the elites or if the you know uh, people of the working class or um, the the labor class also enjoy the tea if the tea sons that you mentioned if that had something to do with you know the, the sort of the young buns drinking the quote unquote real tea versus the working class um, drinking the tea sons. So there are a lot of questions yeah. about who got to drink tea and how and what during the Joseon period. So if you can just add a little bit to that. Yeah. So uh, scholars think um, tea in Joseon dynasty specifically uh, was mainly consumed by the scholars and I would say aristocrats of the society because uh, that's the only uh, resources that are available to us right now. The books and poems are all from the upper class people and um, a lot of people uh, in the lower or like working class was not able to read or like write. I would say like a lot of percentage. Um, they were illiterate. So, um, so far, uh, we know that it was mainly consumed by only by the upper class. Yeah, but in Goryeo Dynasty, it's a bit different because Goryeo had 
Tajom and Taso, all these different uh, tea stalls and tea shops, tea markets. So one can assume that it was consumed by a wider audience. The other group of questions coming in is yeah. um, about growing your own tea plants, mm -hmm. um, because you mentioned um, your ancestor growing his own tea plants. If it's possible, can you do it? Would you recommend <laughs> any growing of tea plants at your own backyard? Yeah. Um, so tea trees are only growing in certain uh, uh, regions in the Korean Peninsula as well. And even in Japan, even in China, not a lot of places because you need to get the perfect climate. Um, you can actually grow tea plants at home, but it's really difficult and they don't grow as tall. And then you could see flowers sometimes because they are in the camellia family, but they have white flowers. But I don't think uh, that's enough to produce tea batches, I guess. Yeah, from what you could, you know, make use of. Yeah. <laughs> but... Yeah, I do recommend um, trying, but you wouldn't get so much tea from it. Yeah, because to make tea, because uh, there's like a lot of drying process in the tea making process. Uh, even if you have so much of, you know, tea leaves, it shrinks. So you get like so little. And that way we understand why tea is so expensive as well. Yeah, so just... You know, if you want to have tea from your own tea plants, you would need to have so many tea trees. Yeah, like a farm. Yeah. And speaking of white teas, actually, a lot of people asking if you can go into the methods of producing the white tea a little bit. Yes. Um, so it's like very similar to Japanese matcha. That's only thing that's available in the market right now. Because um, Japanese matcha was... I would say inspired by the song Diancha. Um, but for Japanese matcha, there's only three three steps to make it. Uh, you would steam tea leaves and dry them, and then you grind them. And that's how you make the powder, and then you whisk it with bamboo whisk. But for the Song Dynasty, Diancha and Korea white tea had eight, seven or like eight steps, yeah. But I do eight steps. Um, so you steam the tea leaves first, and you squeeze out the chlorophyll that's excessive. And then overnight, yeah. And you grind them, tea leaves, and then you make it as if it's like coins. So you shape them into coin discs, and then dry it, and you roast it, and then you store it in like a hangari, which is an earthenware from Korea for maybe five or six months. And then right before the tea ceremony, I would roast it in a gamasot, which is a, a huge uh, cast iron pot. And then I grind them <laughs> and whisk it. So it needs more you know, time and effort. Hi, uh, two questions. Yes. First one is, is most of the key tea that's made, like that's consumed in Korea imported or ex like is it locally produced domestically within the country or do we, like, so do we have a, like a tea producing industry in Korea? Mm -hmm. And then secondly, um, do you think that the philosophy of Korean tea is more like Buddhism focused, so individualistic and focused on finding inner peace, or do you find that there's some wider philosophy that's applicable to producing like a healthy society in Korea? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. For the first one, do we have producers in, Korean Penin in the Korean Peninsula? Yes, uh, we do have some places where they produce a lot of tea, and actually some of them um, are exported to different countries as well. Um, in Jeju Island, there is a huge uh, producer by Osolok. And then in Bosong, there is, um, again, uh, many producers. 
And in Harun County, where I usually go, uh, there are smaller farmer kind of, uh, you know, producers which make, which make, who make um, niche type of tea. Um, so we do have a lot of producers and consumed mainly by Korean people. Yeah, and then even for Japanese type of, you know, tea or like matcha, there are some Korean producers who would make in that way and then produce matcha and like Korean style powder tea. And then they sell them in, in the, for the Korean market. Yeah, so we do. And for the second question, philosophy, um, yeah, I touched a lot on uh, from the Buddhist perspective, but um, Korea in Joseon Dynasty, it was so interesting. It's so interesting that you can see the mixture of Buddhism, Confucianism, even Taoism, everything mixed up together. And then it, you know, uh, invented its own kind of like beliefs and social norms based upon that. Um, and then, yeah, today I was, I talked about uh, more about like the personal, personal um, perspective, but as I kind of shortly mentioned um, at the end, it does have some like, it does include social communication and social interactions in tea ceremonies. So I think it does have some, you know, um, it's um, good deeds for the society. Yes. And then um, in Korea, these days a lot of people go to like tea stores and tea shops to just, you know, sit down and talk with their friends. Just like, you know, Parisian cafes from Belle Epoque now. Um, I have a question. Is it on? Yeah, I think it's on. Um, what inspired you to study the philosophy of Korean tea, and how did you find all the resources to help pursue your studies? Like, for example, this painting, how did you find it? It's actually from everywhere. Um, so I studied art history and education in New York City. I was working at a museum for three years, and then I went back to Korea. But I did uh, Dutch art history from the 17th century, which was, you know, which is very different from what I'm doing right now. Um, since I went back to Korea, I started looking into my own identity because you know, I didn't know much about my own history, my own identity, my own culture. So I actually went on a trip. I went like literally like everywhere and like so many temples in the South to, you know, make myself uh, learn more about my own identity. And I started looking into books and poems um, in an academic way because I had that academic background and uh, there are a lot of resources that are available online and the Korean government has a um, database where you can find all these um, data and uh, books, poems, everything, um, which is so different than what we had in the 90s and 80s. Um, tea was not a field where a lot of scholars um, explored back then, but now, yeah, um, it's available to everybody. And then this painting was accidentally I found um, at the National Museum of Korea. Yeah, um, when I look at a painting, I just I go deep into it and then I want to learn more about it and then I come back home I do my own research on you know uh, the painting and sometimes just like I said I write my own poems yeah that's how I uh, put myself in the learning mode I think yeah it's just a lot of myself you know working as a researcher or like uh, 
a scholar, I would say. Yeah. But yeah, academically trained as a、uh, Western art history, art history, and yeah. We are almost running out of time, okay, okay. so、um, if you have more questions, I'm pre. I'm Sure, Tonya can stick around and talk to you too. But I wanted to end with one of the, actually, few people ask this question online again. So I would like to end with this: What do you think is the most significant meaning of drinking tea? Yeah, just like I said,、uh, we are in such a fast-paced world, and、um, our ancestors and our, you know. People who lived、uh, before us used tea as a method of contemplation and、uh, means of、um, being tranquil, and I think that's much needed in this society right now.、Um, I think that's the most significant thing that we need to,、um, you know, have through tea. If that answers. Thank you so much, Tonya, for、Thank、your you. presentation and your answers tonight. And we have some more tea, so I hope you guys stick around and enjoy. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you.